Hello everyone. I'm Leo Noel. I'm going to present a functional approach to massively concurrent application design. I'm a software researcher. I'm working at Hyperfiddle, specifically on the design of electric closure. Um, this is not a talk about electric closure, this is a talk about missionary. Uh, but most of the concept I'm going to talk about also apply to electric closure because it's essentially a front end for missionary. The missionary is a closure library for supervised data flow programming. So this is a common language to manipulate asynchronous event sources um, that you can use from anywhere in the stack. So you can use it from front end for UIs and you can use it on back end for stream processing, for instance, or you can do both. So it's the same problem space as Clojure, it's for situated programs. Uh, so it's a good fit for uh, any modern web application, especially if it's highly interactive and highly connected. The problems it solves include resource management. A resource is anything you need to produce data over time. Shared process supervision is the way it solves the resource management problem. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the first part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk more about the solution and specifically the technical details about how it solves back pressure streaming and fine grain reactivity. So let's start. What is resource management? Well, this is, in my opinion, the main reason why concurrency is hard. A resource is an object with a time dimension. Because it has a time dimension, it also has a life cycle. It has an extent that is indefinite, and therefore uh, you need to explicitly say when it starts and when it ends. What's an example of that? Well, sockets. Sockets need to be opened and they need to be closed. UI components, they need to be mounted and unmounted. Event handlers. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, event handlers need to be registered and they're registered. Resources contaminate everything they touches. The time dimension is not something you can uh, work around. Uh, it contaminates the process and we need process. So when you have a thread that is parked because it's waiting for an asynchronous result, it's also a resource. It has a life cycle and you may need to interrupt the thread at some point. It doesn't matter if the thread is uh, heavy or lightweight, so it also applies to fibers, virtual threads. All of that are a uh, resource with life cycle that you need to manage. Um, this is accidental, it has nothing to do with the business problem. So that's not the kind of problem you want to solve more than once. It's hard to get right. And if you don't get it right, uh, you get at best performance issues and at worst memory leaks. So that's a serious problem. Garbage collection doesn't help. The reason why it doesn't help is because um, the reference to the resource is bidirectional. There is, it is referenced by the consumer and it is also referenced by the producer. And therefore, uh, if the producer has no way to know if the resource is still needed anymore. So you cannot rely on garbage collection. The problem is even worse with sharing. Uh, yeah, so cache, cache eviction is the most uh, famous instance of this problem. But basically, when you have multiple consumers that share the same resource, they need to coordinate to agree on the right way to manage the life cycle of the resource.
What's the solution to that? Structure. Explicit structure allows for automatic lifecycle management. What we want to achieve is to bind um, the time span where the resource is allocated to the time span when the data produced by this resource is actually needed. So it's demand-driven resource maintenance. So what we're going to, going to do is bind the machinery to the producer, and the consumer will be in charge of the supervision. What that means is we are going to have uh, add more constraint to our programming model. And what we gain from that is we are going to eliminate an entire class of bugs that are related to bad resource lifecycle management. So the goal is to build a chain of uh, responsibility that will make sure each resource is recursively uh, disposed with all of its dependent resources. So that's, there is nothing new here. Uh, I've talked about that before. In fact, it's uh, one of the problems functional FX systems solve. Rx is an example of that. And there are many other instances of that, especially in the um, statically typed functional programming languages like Scala and Haskell and OCaml. Uh, structure concurrency is one other solution to the same problem. It's the imperative version of the supervision problem. It's uh, currently implemented in Project Loom with structure task scope. I'm not exactly sure the status of this project, but they, they are working on that. So they, they are taking the project seriously. Uh, one other example is a uh, resource acquisition is initialization. It's the same idea. So you have an object that expose a data source, and this data source is backed by a resource with a life cycle. So we attach um, the actions of this life cycle to the constructor and the destructor of this object, such that the life cycle of the object is bound to the life cycle of the resource. So uh, what does it look like in a practical use case? So I have an example for you, which is a Slack client. So we are going to see how it works and what the tree supervision looks like. Uh, the first version of our Slack client will have a channel list and channel view. So on the left, you can select the current channel and on the right, you are viewing the current channel. So the supervision tree looks like this. At the top of the supervision tree, we have the main view, which has two children, the channel list and the channel view for the current channel. And the channel view uh, is dependent on another resource, which is the WebSocket in charge of pushing the post for this channel for rendering. And now we go, we want to see what happens when uh, the user asks for another channel. So it's going to select the random channel. And in this case, what we want to do is to dispose the current channel view. The channel view must dispose the WebSocket channel. And we need to reconstruct this entire branch for the new channel, which is the random channel and uh, reconstruct uh, and make sure that all the resources are properly disposed and recreated. So channel list returns another value, which is the random channel. So main view implements a switch. A switch means uh, we dispose the current branch and we create a new one. So we cancel the current view. The UI component needs to unmount, but, but here, before unmounting, it has to dispose all of its dependencies. In this case, the WebSocket channel. So we ask the WebSocket channel to dispose. That means we are going to close the connection and garbage collect it. And at this point, we can unmount the component. And now we can recreate the new channel view for the random channel. And again, create the WebSocket that connects 
to the posts of the random channel and finally render the post for this channel. So that's tree supervision. Uh, it's the construction of a chain of responsibility where uh, every dependent resource is encapsulated by its parent. Uh, so this works well, uh, but now we are going to see a more complex example that illustrates the problem of sharing. So Slack client v2. We keep our channel list and our channel view, and we're going to add a profile view and a DM list. So the profile view is basically you can click on any user in the channel, and this will open the profile view, and you can see information about the user, and especially you can see the active status. And this information, this information is also available in the DM view. The DM view uh, shows the latest 10 interaction with uh, specific users, and it also shows the active status. So there is going to be a shared resource to retrieve the active status. So now the supervision uh, tree is not a tree anymore. It's a DAG because it has a shared resource here. The WebSocket in charge of fetching the user status for the current user. And this value is used by both the profile view and the DM list. So this resource uh, has two supervisors, right? So again, what should happen when the user requests a change of the active channel? So the user clicks random. The channel list returns random. The main view has to discard the current view. So it will request cancellation of the, the channel view. We can ask the WebSocket channel for the closure channel to close, and we can dispose it. And then we have another children to dispose, the profile view, so we need to dispose it as well. And now we need to dispose the child of the profile view, but now it's different because we cannot dispose the WebSocket statue it's because it's already used by another component, the DM list. So in this case, we just detach this branch from the graph, and we continue the propagation. And the rest is the same. We reconstruct the view for the random channel, and we reconstruct the socket that retrieves the post for the random channel. And finally, we can render the post. So this is DAG supervision. It is light tree supervision, but you have shared resource, and shared resource ha can have multiple supervisors. And it's a tricky problem because uh, there are many possible scenarios. In this case, uh, we know the right thing to do was to keep the WebSocket alive. But uh, what happens on the last connection? For instance, if, um, if uh, the user doesn't appear anymore on the DM list, uh, when the WebSocket should be created? Well, all of those are real questions, right? So, What's the right answer to that supervision problem? Uh, it turns out the answer is pretty simple, but before we talk about that, let's talk about existing solutions. Uh, we have common constructions for uh, sharing resources, and they are not managed. So we have futures, we have async await, go blocks, lazy sequence, delays. All of that is about sharing. The problem is, uh, what happens when you spawn a future? What you get is a container. You know the container will be filled uh, with a value at some point. But you have no reference to the process. So you have a resource that was spawned, and it's not managed by anyone. So it's a global resource. It's a, it's a global singleton. It's the same for async await, and it's the same for GoBlock. You lose a reference to the process. So if at some point you need to discard this process, it's not possible. You need to plan it in front. So it's not something you can compose upon. Lazy sequence and delays. Uh, this is slightly better because the 
underlying process doesn't start until the value is actually needed. But still, they don't support consolidation. When the first consumer requests the value, the process started, and there is no way to stop it. Well, in fact, you can stop it. But you, if you crash the delay, and you can reuse it anymore afterwards. So that's clearly not the right behavior. Uh, so all of these solutions are variations uh, around the global singleton pattern. So that's not something we should use for uh, local sharing. So the right solution is, uh, in fact, something we do all the time in the real world without even thinking about it. And the right way to illustrate this is this ID, the last one turns off the lights. Uh, so this is a DAG for the real world. We have a company. The company supervises employees. Uh, the employees are resource. They are literally called human resources. And each employee shares responsibility for a technical resource, which is the license. So it's it's a DAG. And what happens, what is the supervision policy for the light system? Well, if, um, if Michael wants uh, to pretend he's busy, he's going to uh, stay late at work. So it's the last one to quit. So he's in charge of the, turning off the light, right? But the next day, uh, if Pam arrives first, she's in charge of turning on the light. So this is the exact same problem as the user WebSocket that we talked about before, right? What we want is allocate on first sub and dispose on last and sub. Um, so that's the end of the first part of about DAG supervision. Is there any question about this right now? So um, Missionary started as an experiment many years ago um, after many failed experiments. And the hypothesis was that functional effect system could be improved. Uh, the idea was uh, continuous time is a good idea. Continuous time means uh, we have variable, uh, so container with variable state inside. And the reading is decoupled from the writing. So we have writers. And because there is always a current valid state, and each new state invalidates the previous one, then the readers don't have to keep up. We can sample the value at any point in time you want, and the writers don't have to care about that. Um, that's highly useful, uh, especially in UI programming. UIs are all about continuous time because, well, the, the DOM itself is a massive uh, mutable data structure with variable state all over the place. And yeah, there, 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 are, there can be many complex interactions between these pieces of state. So the changes can come from anywhere. They can come from user event. They can come from the network. And so it's a massively concurrent application. So we need um, we need correct resource management. Uh, it's highly dynamic. So we spend our time allocating and deallocating resources. So we need to get it right. And that's a hard problem. And it turns out uh, effect systems are a solution to this problem. The problem is, um, well, at this time, the popular effect system in Java was Rx, and Rx doesn't properly implement continuous time. Uh, so the reason why it doesn't properly implement continuous time is because it has no synchronicity semantics. So uh, it's hard to share values. Because uh, so synchronicity is when uh, you want to express the idea that two events are conceptually simultaneous because one is a reaction of the other. Uh, and it's important because, for instance, if you want to subscribe twice to uh, a single 
shared resource, then you have to be able to express the fact that it's actually a simultaneous subscri subscription. Otherwise, you uh, the order of subscription matters and you risk to lose some events. Uh, so there are workarounds for that to uh, control the ordering of um, the process starting. Uh, you can delay the connecting of the nodes in the graph, stuff like that, but that's, um, that's not convenient. And that is due to the lack of synchronicity semantics. One other reason is uh, the underlying stream protocol is fundamentally glitchy. To solve the glitch problem, the so a, a glitch is an inconsistency uh, that is visible to the user and that's a bug in continuous time that's a known bug and it's hard to implement properly and the reason why it's not possible to implement properly is in rx is that it's not possible to for um, um, a node to invalidate its state and communicate this information downwards without actually computing the value and Fixing the glitch problem implies uh, first invalidating everything and then recomputing everything. So the string protocol doesn't support that. And so therefore, the idea is, can we have our cake and eat it too? So we have a functional effects system that also supports continuous time. And it turns out if we solve these two problems, uh, it's possible to have both. And it's actually a good way to um, have uh, massively concurrent UIs in continuous time and program UIs, UIs uh, in this way. So that's the plan. Missionary is a functional effect system. That means effects are values. You can compose effects uh, with functional composition. Uh, it's end to one. So you have many inputs and you want to produce one input. So it's functional composition. You can share effects uh, with memorization. Memorization is one way of sharing. In this case, you have one input and you want to distribute it to many outputs. Uh, these shared effects are supervised by uh, the strategy we talked before, uh, the, the last one turns of the light. Uh, we have synchronous semantics, so the composition model supports um, the idea that two events can be simultaneous. This is implemented as reentrant re calls. That means uh, if you perform a side effect in user code, it will also be considered synchronous to the current event. And it supervises data flow, uh, so it supports error handling out of the box and where it will shut down to uh, properly dispose resources. And bidirectional IPC is what we need to implement uh, back pressure and solve the glitch problem that I talked just before. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now. So that's the flow protocol. And the flow protocol is um, the part that is common to all effects that produce multiple values. An effect is one part that is specific to the effect and one part that is common to all effect, which is the common language. So the flow protocol is basically uh, one way for a producer process and a consumer process, so two successive stages of the pipeline, to agree on the state of the connection. So they are each responsible for one subset of the events of the state machine. And the state machine has three states. It's either idle, ready, or terminated. It starts idle. And at any point in time, the producer can uh, decide that it's ready to transfer, at which point the connection is ready to transfer. And when the connection is ready to transfer, the consumer is able to emit a transfer event. The value that is transferred is returned synchronously with the transfer callback. All of these things are callbacks. So it's, it's bidirectional. So the, both the producer and the consumer need to uh, agree that they are able to perform the transfer. So to implement back pressure, the consumer will just delay the transfer. 
until it's ready. And to implement um, invalidation that is required for the glitch field protocol, the producer will just call the step that will inform the consumer that the state is invalidated. And then the propagation algorithm will uh, take care of propagating this information in the right order, such that the transfer only happens afterwards. And I'm going to talk about the propagation algorithm right now. So um, the state machine we just saw is in this arrow. So in this case, it's black, which means idle. And if it becomes blue, that means it becomes ready to transfer. The arrow indicates the direction of the data flow. And the constellation is the on the other direction. So the data flow from top to bottom. This is the... Um, um, the graph of processes for this program. And this program is the minimal example you can write to illustrate the glitch problem. Uh, so the key feature is the diamond. So there is a diamond shape here. And the problem is there is a node that has two subscriptions and we want to make sure all the subscriptions of this node are fully propagated because before we propagate this node because effects will be run on the final stage. So the input is an atom, but it could be anything, but it's, in this case, it's an atom. We have a first publisher, which is this guy, and it's backed by a watch that is observing the current state of the atom. Then we have another signal that is the latest operator. So it's adding the two values of the input. So it's, it's a multiplication by two, but it's with addition. And finally, we have a reduce stage that is printing values on the console. So we're going to run this program and see the successive values of the final stage of the pipeline. So the initial value is zero because that's the initial state of the atom that we add to itself. And then we are going to swap the atom. And we are going to observe what happens. And the result we expect is two. A glitchy implementation would produce one, two, and one is an inconsistent state because it's, uh, it uh, doesn't match the atomic propagation of the swap from zero to one to all the successive stage of the graph. So let's start. We call swap input ink. Uh, so the current state of the atom will be updated. So the value of the atom is now one. Uh, the watches will be notified. In this case, there is one watch which is provided by the watch operator. Uh, watch will step its output. So the, the output is ready to transfer. We've reached the publisher. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot to explain that. Uh, so this is the call stack. This is the actual call stack of uh, the host platform. Uh, the priority queue is internal to the propagation algorithm, and it will make sure that the nodes are traversed in the right order. So a priority queue is a data structure that takes always on the front, but uh, items are enqueued according to their inherent order. And in this case, the order of element is an order that must be compatible with the topological ordering of the graph. So input is guaranteed to always be before twice because it comes before in the subtraction dependency graph. So uh, we add input to the queue because it's a publisher. And the queue was initially empty, so we can process it right now. So we process input, and that will invalidate the current state of the input. Uh, now we want to propagate the dirty information, but input has two subscribers. So we, we're going to propagate one and the other after. 
So we step the left subscriber of input. We're going to propagate to latest that we invalidate the current state of the left hand side. At this point, we know uh, the latest uh, result is not valid anymore. So we invalidate the state of latest. We step latest, say so it invalidates the output. We propagate to the twice publisher. And because it's a publisher, we were going to unqueue it in the priority queue. So we're going to process it later because we are not done processing input. So now we can rewind the stack and start propagating the dirty state to the right subscriber. Step input right, invalidate the right hand side of the input. We propagate to latest, we invalidate the right hand side of the latest state. And at this point, latest is already dirty, so there's no point propagating further. So we can rewind the stack, DQ from uh, the priority queue, and continue to process node, and so on. So we process twice, we invalidate the input. We step twice to uh, mark the output as ready to transfer. And at this point, it reaches reduce. Reduce uh, consumes value as fast as possible. And therefore, reduce will request transfer immediately. So at this point, we transfer twice. Twice has an invalidated input, so it has to recompute it. So we have to transfer latest. Latest has to transfer both of its input to compute the addition. So we transfer the left hand side. Input is also invalidated. So it has to recompute its value from the watch. And the watch we call the ref on the input to get the current state of the atom. So we can return this value, which is one, and update the current state of input. And we can return this result to the left-hand side of the latest. Now we need to update the right-hand side of latest, so we can again request transfer on the right-hand side of the input. In this case, the value the, the value one is already memoized, so we can reuse it. So it return immediately. At this point, we can perform the addition. So we call plus, it returns two. We return this result to the twice operator, which is going to update its internal state, and finally return it to reduce, which we, which will turn in turn call println on two. Uh, and that's the end of the propagation. So we can rewind the stack and exit the swap. So all of that has happened synchronously with the swap. And that's how we implement uh, glitch-free propagation of change. Uh, so that's a very simple example. But have you seen um, there's a lot happening? Uh, the good news is it, uh, it scales to arbitrary large graphs, even if the graph is dynamic. So it's possible, for instance, to reconstruct an entire part of the graph and attach it at any point in the graph while you are pro actually propagating the value. You can also discard part of the graph in the same way. And the propagation algorithm would make sure uh, the propagation is uh, always performed in the right order, even if uh, there are new nodes at, that are added in the meantime. Uh, it also works uh, for arbitrary signal definitions. That's why it's interesting to separate the publishing part from the definition part. In this case, it's just a watch and a latest, but it could be arbitrary effects. Uh, we could craft a continuous value from uh, discrete inputs from the network, for instance. Um, if you want to perform an asynchronous computation in reaction to a state change in the middle of the graph and re-inject it afterwards, that also works. Uh, so that's um, that's a successful experiment. What this proves is it's possible for functional effect systems to implement continuous time reactivity. And the way we achieve that is by giving um, synchronicity semantics and uh, a flow, uh, a, an in, a bidirectional, bidirectional interprocess communication that allows to inform 
about the invalidated state without actually computing the value. So that's a success. We've been validating that model at scale with electric closure. We, we've been working on that for more than two years now. Uh, we've been using electric closure for serious business application and this algorithm just works. We, we experience really no problem with that. So that's a huge success. Um, yes, so that's, we learn many things while developing electric closure and that supervision. So the, the thing that I talked in the first part of the talk is just one of them, but that's the most interesting learning to me. Uh, to me, DAX supervision is the right set of constraints to manage resources in a, in a complex reactive application. Uh, that's slightly embarrassing because the answer is so obvious and the solution is so simple and it's also a perfect fit for the model. Uh, and still, it took me almost 10 years to understand that and well, yeah, the solution was right in front of me all the time. So I guess that's what we call progress. Uh, you can try it now in missionary. It's not available in electric. Uh, it should be in the next version. Uh, also, um, we've made good progress on the documentation and we're going to communicate about it very soon. And before concluding, uh, I want to make it clear that the the state of this library is uh, it the, the the state it is now would not be um, possible without all this development we 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 made with electric. So really, uh, this is the work of a team and I want to make it clear that um, uh, I want to share the, the ownership of this success with the entire hyperfidal team that trust me to um, test this technology that was at the time highly experimental and is now battle tested. So yeah, thank you hyperfidal. <laughs>